Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. And today we have uh, a very special guest. Um, it's Libby Fernley, and uh, she's quite accomplished. Uh, she's an author, a teacher, um, and a whole bunch of other things. And she's got a, a vast wealth of knowledge about the textile business, and especially about uh, sustainability. Uh, which is a uh, question that really interests me and um, would hope to get into more and more over the next uh, few months. But Libby, can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. Um, so my journey into sustainability began, um, I started my career as a designer um, for the made department stores in St. Louis. And um, in that role, I got to do a lot of traveling. I traveled around the world to Asia and India and through Europe. And um, I don't know, I guess I, I kind of got sucked into to the grind of the industry. And um, after about a decade working for big brands like Limited and, um, and Aeropostale and I did some freelancing, um, I, I started to lose interest, I think, because I, was, I wasn't able to, I wasn't feeling fulfilled in my role. Um, and I was starting a family, so I took a, a breather. And um, it's interesting because I, I thought for sure I wanted to change my career to something entirely different. Um, and in the end, I decided that I can run away from something I thought I didn't like, or I can see if I can shift it towards something that uh, has more value and more meaning to me. So that's that's what I ended up doing. I went back to FIT and um, I studied sustainable in their sustainable design entrepreneurs program, which is amazing. And it's for professionals. So um, it's at night, their classes are in the, uh, from six to nine at night, weeknights. Um, and it's just re a really great community. And now I'm teaching in that program. Um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of how I got Oh, I got here. This is my my career shift was uh, was from design to uh, sustainability. And were you a particular type of designer? Uh, mostly wovens, women's women's wovens apparel, but I also did some knitwear and loungewear. Okay. Well. Um, okay, so I have a bunch of questions for you. Uh, they're really sustainability questions that I've had mm -hmm. on my mind for a while. Awesome. And um, I'm just going to shoot them at you. If uh, if there's one that they're not in great order because my okay. thoughts weren't in great order. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, if there's um, if there's something you'd rather not answer or answer later with you know with something else, that's that's fine. I'm totally okay with that. So okay. I'm just going to blast away, and you put a hand up if I'm uh, if I'm off course. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so are sustainability and circularity uh, interchangeable terms? Uh, not really. I think sustainability is more of a holistic concept um, and it involves both the people and the planet, whereas circularity is about keeping materials in the system um, as long as possible and returning uh, materials to the earth when it loses value. I also view circularity as something that can be applied as a business model, um, whereas sustainability is really just a concept that means that something can't, whether or not something can keep going on and on forever, right? So um, yeah, if, if something can't be done over and over in theory forever, then it's, it's not sustainable. Okay, so when Patagonia would drive a truck around to uh, repair people's clothing, mm -hmm. Is that considered circularity? Yeah, definitely, because it's keeping it's keeping materials in the system for as long as they can. So I think that's a you know a huge part of the problem right now is that because um, especially apparel especially has gotten so in, inexpensive and fast fashion has taken over, we don't have we don't value things the same way we used to, and and buying things and throwing them away mm -hmm. felt um, easier than repairing them, right? But when sure. you when you value something and it's special to you and it holds some meaning to you, uh, you're more likely to do what it takes to um, keep it going. I, I mean, I like to think about it as like your very favorite boots, right? 
I think of my very favorite boots that I've had resold like seven times, you know, and, and, but I, you know, they were made, they were handmade and I paid a couple hundred dollars for them, but they lasted me 15 years, you know, as opposed to buying a new pair every year or every two years that where the soles just, the glue breaks down and they fall off, you know? Right. Yeah, I have clothes I feel that way about, um, and my wife doesn't feel the same way about them. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, they should go in the garbage. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, it's definitely a transition, especially menswear. You know, you don't, you don't see the fast fashion doesn't impact menswear as much. Yeah, yeah. Although, like, um, you know, outdoor goods, you know, oh. uh, you know like a Patagonia, and mm -hmm. Eddie Bauer, and those kind of guys. Um, I think they do a pretty good job at it. And I think Patagonia has actually been like one of the, the standard bearers um, on, you know, organic fibers and uh, organic Definitely. dyes. So I, I, um, I do respect them for that. For sure. Um, will reducing greenhouse gases, um, will that reverse the damage that's been done to the atmosphere or will that, um, or just slow the damage from happening uh, more? Yeah, it, it's just gonna slow the damage. It's just going to put off the inevitable. Whereas um, climate drawdown or removing carbon from the atmosphere and via carbon sinks like our ocean and our soil actually can reverse climate change and reverse the damage um, that's been done. Um, a great resource if you haven't heard of it is drawdown.org. I even see my, my middle schooler, his school's curriculum uh, includes drawdown.org. They've got great, great information there. Okay. And all about how we can uh, draw carbon from the atmosphere back into our water and our soil. Yeah, and for uh, the audience, we will provide, or Libby will provide, uh, a reference um, PowerPoint, basically, with uh, all sorts of books, websites, um, uh, blogs, all sorts of information uh, on, on what we're discussing. So can I just really nice can I interject? Because I left sure. something out earlier when I was letting you know about my background. Um, part of the reason I ended up developing this course for FIT was because I was uh, collaborating on a book with uh, my dear friend Marcy Zeroff, who is, has been in the eco-fashion space since the 90s. She actually trademarked and coined the phrase eco-fashion. Um, and in researching that book, it was so frustrating because every time I wrote a draft, I got to the end and went back to revise and everything had become outdated. Uh, sustainability is so hard to keep up with because it's such a moving target. And that's why I chose to develop this course because um, I basically take all of the newest research and the newest resources and compile them into a, a 12 hour course. Yeah. Um, because who has time for that? <laughs> yeah, right. Well, it just, it seems like the more I looked at it, it just seems that it's so all encompassing. Mm -hmm. um, it goes, and then my next question really kind of uh, leads to that is that it's just so much, you know, there's environmental, there's product, there's human rights, there's inclusivities. Um, so it, it, it really is a huge, huge topic, which leads me to this question, um, mm -hmm. that how do, how does sustainability and human rights relate to each other? Well, some people view sustainability just from the environmental lens. Um, and I personally think that's flawed because humans are part of the environment. And oftentimes we view ourselves as separate from the rest of nature, but really we are totally part of it. it we're all, it's all interconnected, right? So when people say, oh, we need to save the planet, what they really mean is we need to save ourselves. We need to save humanity because Earth sustains us. Earth will keep going on without us, right? Um, so things like access to a living wage, um, offering a healthy work environment to workers, and all the other human rights that are defined in the, the UN, um, the Declaration of Human Rights developed by the, the UN, um, they're all part of sustainability because without them, we can't 
humanity can't continue, right? So, and as I said before, habits that can't be replicated indefinitely are inherently unsustainable. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, so it's, it's just, you know, I think the, inter the interconnection sometimes can be a little bit uh, overwhelming and hard to grasp for people, but um, we are very much part of nature. Yeah, absolutely. As we can Although see. we, you know, get, get away from it a little bit. For sure. Um, in our day to day. What is upcycling and dead stock? Sure. So upcycling is uh, when we add value to something that has been devalued or perceived as waste. Um, dead, stack, dead stock is pre-consumer waste from our, well, in our industry, it's pre-consumer fabric waste, like un, um, bolts of fabric that haven't been used comp entirely or completely. Uh, that are otherwise brand new, but unused. And there are organizations like the Queen of Raw, founded by Stephanie Benedetto and Fab Scrap. Um, these are, I think they're both New York based, but um, I think they, they sell globally. But they sell off, they, they or collect and organize and resell off dead stock fabric to smaller brands. Um, and when it comes to upcycling, I mean, I don't know how looped in you are with, with the latest runway shows. This, this fall was really exciting. The designers got super creative um, during the pandemic and, and came up with all different ways to show for the first time um, online or, you know, Moschino did a puppet show. There was a, a lot of um, 3D modeling and animation. Yeah incorporated into some of the runway sh shows, but upcycling actually um, was a technique that a lot of uh, designers incorporated for the first time. And I think up until now, it's kind of been viewed as something that's like more hippy dippy, small scale, sustainable brands. And, and we saw Stella McCartney, Louis Vuitton, um, lots of high-end designers on the runway using dead stock and upcycling as well. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that's something that will um, also influence trade shows? Do I think it because um, they'll be mostly virtual? I mean, hmm, hard to say. I think that a lot of the, um, you know, there are definitely a lot of mills and fabric suppliers that are clinging to the old way. And I think they're going to continue that, but um, yeah, I think I think it's it's about balance. I don't think we're going to ever be all upcycled and dead stock. So I think right. um, when it comes to new materials and raw materials, we'll just see more of a shift in the trade shows um, where where people are shifting to organic and recycled fibers. Yeah, yeah. So. During the pandemic, the, the whole working from home um, has really changed fashion also. Could you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, I think that dressing comfortably was already on the rise, you know, the, the whole athleisure movement. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that people are going to be going back even after we're all vaccinated and we're all back to work. I think that there's going to be uh, more of a tolerance for working from home and uh, finding that balance. Um, versatility, I definitely think it's gonna be the name of the game in the future. It's gonna be a key draw, um, being able to be comfortable at home and, or dress something up easily just by throwing something um, you know, on a blazer or, or a sweater uh, to go into the office for a meeting. I think that's gonna be the big, the big push. And I think we'll, we'll also continue to see a rise in, in waist up dressing. So really where the, the fun part of the outfit is on the top for meetings mm -hmm. like this. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, my wife is a therapist and she does therapy from inside the house <laughs> and she you know, wears sweatpants and a really nice shirt. Yep. It's kind I'm of funny. It looks <laughs> and she'll be mad that I brought it up. Um, but she'll never watch this anyway. So. <laughs> um, why, why is inclusivity a sustainability issue? Sure, so it's interesting because 
I think people are very quick to, just, like I said before, to define um, sustainability as something that's about the planet and about nature and about the earth. But, um, you know, it's such an important big movement. You know, I think you, you might have heard this phrase, it takes everyone to change everything, right? So to leave people out of a movement that requires everyone is just, it doesn't help anyone. <laughs> You know, so we, we need unity to move mountains and the scale of this issue, the, the ex, existential issues we face, you know, requires us all to be involved. And especially, and when it comes to like racial inclusion as well, um, you know, sustainability is, is an inherently uh, black, brown, indigenous uh, concept. You know, cultures around the world have been operating sustainably for eons you know, right. it feels like and um right. it just feels like the business world is just catching on to this like oh they, like it's a new it's a new thing but it's not it's been around for ages so when i see all these um undergarment um commercials where you know they're they do all sorts of different size for all sorts of different women mm -hmm. is that considered um inclusivity also Sure. I mean, when it, when it comes to apparel, over half of American women are above a size 14. It doesn't make sense to, to only have one, you know, image that we associate with a model. It's, it just, it doesn't make anyone feel like they're part of fashion when it, that's just, it's just not smart to ignore over half of the female population in, the, in America. So especially when it comes to conscious fashion, I think that um, the, the, the conscious fashion agenda has been labeled elitist and exclusive. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that up until now, they really have only shown a particular, you know, white, slim models. And it's just obsolete. You know, people are realizing like, this doesn't make any sense. We need to include everyone not just for business, but because we need everyone on board. Right, right. How does, how does, how does live streaming affect the retail uh, business? Yeah, this is, this is a new one for me. You know, I- um, I'll Take a stab at it. I've been, no, I've been, <laughs> I've been uh, you know, teaching this course for a couple of years and uh, all of a sudden it's like live streaming, live streaming, you know, and I'm like, what does that even mean? Live stream shopping, you know, and it's really just like QVC meets um, Instagram kind of. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, I, it seemed to be kind of a temporary fix for um, us not being able to get into to the stores during lockdown. But companies and retailers and influencers are shaping this new like tech landscape into, you know, a, a reimagined QVC for the next generation. And I, I definitely think that we'll see more of it, especially as we continue to see disruption from pandemics and extreme weather and political unrest, you know, we need to have backup plans. And I think this, this year has really proven that, that, that we need to rethink how we can be more resilient. Yeah, yeah. And that wouldn't, that's not going away. I mean, that's, yeah, that's here to stay, I would imagine. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, <laughs> <laughs> definitely. <laughs> yeah. Um, there, there's a whole, you know, thought and, and, and product um, out there about uh, customization. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, customizing your fit and and that kind of thing, and, and that kind of fascinates me. You know, you can you can buy an app that can measure you, and you can send those measurements to you know Levi or whatever it is, and and come back with the perfect pair of jeans. Do you do you see more of that happening? Definitely, and it's a it's also a great way to hit that inclusion mark. You know, the body inclusion because let's face it, we're all different, um, and you know, it, it's there's this. This has just been an unprecedented moment for customers and companies to embrace new technology. So, um, one app that I learned about in, uh, recently in the last course I was teaching was called My Size ID, um, and 
It's an app that you use your mobile device and take two, I think it's two photos of um, two selfies or of, of your body and it can calculate your measure, measurements. And then that data can then be used, you know, the con customers can, um, it can direct customers to styles that will fit them from different brands um, or companies can collaborate with custom makers sorry, customers can then collaborate with custom makers for made to order items. It's being used in a lot of different ways and there's um, a slew of apps and um, technologies that are coming out of this. Another one is called uh, FitMatch and that's like a, a mall based kiosk that you go in and it takes your measurements and all of the retailers in the mall have their, um, their products uploaded and their, their size charts. And it will tell you if you fall between a size, depending on the, the fit of each garment, it'll tell you which one is going to fit you well. And even some, some of this technology has, you can try it, try it on virtually, order it right there at the kiosk, and then um, you know go get lunch and pick it up at the store on your way out. It's, it's really, I mean, we're seeing a lot of cool solutions yeah, to really problems cool. we didn't even know we had. <laughs> right. And you know, I guess buying the right clothes that fit uh, so you're not throwing something out. Uh, exactly. that, that would be a sustainability uh, issue also. Definitely. So there's a, a lot of technologies that just like this that are happening and I think will be interesting um, and helpful uh, down the road. Like I think about on the raw material side, uh, putting uh, identifiers in fiber. So mm -hmm. You can see where it's been grown and is that, did they grow it in a sustainable way? Um, uh, you know, th that kind of stuff, I think it's just really neat and, and um, it's about time. Yeah. Do you see any other, th any other technologies like that coming down the pipe? Um, in terms of fiber traceability, um, it's, it's just so important in, in the fight against greenwashing, right, to know the origin of our fibers is becoming, first of all, consumers are becoming aware of the fact of the questions that they need to ask to feel good about their purchases. And um, transparency is, is one of those ways and, and communi communicating that transparency. Okay, how do you, you say it's organic, but how do I believe you? How can I trust you? So it's about, and, and in this age of, you know, fake news and who can I believe, everyone's kind of feeling like they, they can't trust anyone, right? Uh, we've got this trust deficit, I'm calling it. But, um, but now there's, there's easy ways to track and trace fiber um, from Applied DNA Sciences, which is a company that, uh, that traces the DNA of a fiber all the way through the supply chain and tests it along the way. Um, RFID, which is radio frequency identification is also being used to track and trace uh, that, that's further along the sub supply chain. And then not to mention programmable threads, you know, uh, these, uh, they, they put in these washable fibers that can be detect programmed practically um, and to help manage a product from the farm to the consumer and to make sure it's coming from where they say it's coming from. You know, in, in the past, we've had a lot of issues with, um, you know, subcontractors and not knowing who's making, who's sewing, where, where it's coming from and mixing organic fibers with conventional fibers and then selling it as organic and that's you know they're, they're finding ways to make it full you know more more sustainable and more transparent and more trustworthy right yeah that's probably uh, some kind of a wire that is so you know micro uh small uh nanotechnology or whatnot. Yeah. they're able to weave it in without anybody ever seeing it yeah, if anybody asks, I can find it. I, I can't remember the name of the company off the top of my head, but I'm happy to <laughs> get that information to you. It's very cool. Okay. Um, so here's my favorite subject to bash is uh, fast, <laughs> to fast fashion, because I think it's done a lot of damage in the industry um, in a lot of different ways, from originality to um, just quality of goods. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's affected my, my business uh, greatly. But do you think that fast fashion will survive um, the, the post-COVID um, landscape? You know, it's interesting because I used to be 
I used to feel like we should include everybody in the sustainability movement, you know, and there are some um, fast fashion companies that have made very real commitments to sustainability. Um, and, you know, I've become less tolerant over time um, because they're definitely talking out of both sides of their mouth. Um, but, uh, you know, right now we're seeing some of the biggest um, defining fast fashion brands like Topshop and they're unable to stay afloat. H&M is suffering, their sales are suffering. But the, then again, you know, they're not really the cheapest fast fashion. They're more like the middle-class fast fashion. Sure. Some of the really, really inexpensive brands, especially um, in Europe and the UK, like Boohoo and Pretty Little Things, I think it's called, um, they're, they're still doing well. And they, they have faced all sorts of human rights issues this year. And, and yet they still continue to stay afloat. So I think we're seeing this kind of, um, the, the middle of the road fast fashion companies suffering, but the, the cheap, cheap stuff is, is, still, is still going. And I think we may have to hit rock bottom before, um, yeah. before we rebuild. But, but at the same time, I just wanna throw, out, throw this out that a lot of the people that depend on the cheap, cheap fast fashion um, that fits their budget, um, are going to be able to turn to other modes of shopping like resale. I think resale, um, you know, a, a recent thread up study showed that resale is set to overtake traditional retail in the next oh. couple of years. Wow. That's, so that's a huge statement. It's huge. I, and I can't, I can't believe it because it's too big. It's too big. So I think as resale becomes more accessible and as they, um, as they scale up and, and grow. I mean, I definitely think Topshop is one of the, or sorry, not Topshop, ThreadUp is one of the, the best um, online resellers right now and a, a great model for, you know, cause it's also consignment, you know, you can, you can send them, they'll send you a bag, you fill it up with your stuff and then they take it, whatever they think is resellable, um, they post and whatever they don't, they recycle or donate. And, um, and yeah, and you can make, I've definitely. Well, in there. That's, that's <laughs> interesting. Yeah, ever since I saw that uh, article about H&M um, burning, I think, what was it, $6 billion worth or 6 billion euros yeah. worth uh -huh. of, of clothing uh, because it was either, they said because it might have mold on it, but uh, everybody knows it was just overproduced and, um, and they don't want it to lose value. Yeah. And, and, but it's not just H and M. It's uh, uh, Burberry was busted doing yeah. it too. Yeah, Gucci, I think, and mm -hmm. several companies were doing the same. So, um, but this naming and shaming business, you know, some people are, you know, not too keen on, you know, like, oh, we we should give them another shot, you know. <laughs> Um, but I think it's important to call to call out brands when they mess up like that. Yeah. And to say, you know, and boycott them or wh whatever it takes to get them to to, to um, be held accountable for their wrongdoing. Yeah. Boy, there's a lot of shaming going on uh, in this country, and I'm sure mm -hmm. others too, um, from all sorts of angles. Yeah. I don't know where that started. <laughs> I'm sorry. I wonder where that started from. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> you know what, is, what is that about? Um, so um, the fast fashion um, people, they are, um, I wonder if the, the um, what is like, does the demographic of, of their, their client um, influence whether they are open to buying sustainable goods or not? You know, does does the you know fourteen year old girl and I'm, I'm I apologize to all fourteen year old girls out mm. there, um, but um, you know, do they just don't care and they want to buy a blouse for twelve bucks? Um, I think fourteen year old girls want to buy a blouse for twelve bucks that's sustainable. Right. Yeah. You know, they want it all. These you know, this generation says, "Hey, I can have this and th this and this, and it doesn't need to be this or that." And we're seeing, you know, companies like Pact, you know, that you might target, uh, do 
uh, sustainable organic regenerative uh, apparel and at a price point that most people can afford that lasts longer. And, um, you know, I think that's going to be really part of part of the movement movement is making sustainability affordable and it's happening it's happening as, as we speak it's right. becoming more and more accessible to um different wouldn't markets be, wouldn't that be fun to watch a bunch of girls and i have a daughter that's 13 yeah. um and bragging that their their uh, their outfit is sustainable yeah well even if it's second hand it's sustainable <laughs> you know that's the other thing about resa resale it's like that's right okay i can't afford the you know stella mccartney but but i can afford to shop resale and it was going to be trash. So it's, it's just as important, if not more important. Yeah, interesting. So uh, ever since I've been in the business, uh, which is um, going back to the 1940s, they, um, everybody's always been talking about um, there's too many retailers. There's too much retail space. There's too much square footage. Mm -hmm. um, and that's going to come down. It's going to come down. It's going to come down. Mm -hmm. And now it's it's actually to a point where I think it really might come down. I think that you know a lot of retailers are not going to be here uh, at the end of next year. Yeah. But how do you see that? Do you see a lot of uh, shakeout in the retail market? I mean, I think there's always going to have to, and I and I said this before, have to be a balance between like the smaller local shops um, where you get things that just are really special and you know the person that made it or the designer um, and then the larger big box stores. I just think we're gonna see more of a divide between um, the product that is successful. So like people will be going to the Amazons and the Walmarts and the Targets of the world for one-stop shopping, you know, because we live these busy lives where we need to, you know, we don't have time to like jump all over, all over the place to get things. but when it so like for staples like socks and underwear and pencils and toilet paper and things that we don't necessarily value as much i think we're going to be continue to go to these um larger corporations but increasingly i think as we kind of get back especially during the pandemic as we get back to like what really matters and what do we love what do we value and as we look inward um i i think people are gonna definitely seek out um, companies and individuals that they want to actively and consciously support, right? So I think nobody, you can't feel like super good about ordering from Amazon, but we're busy, P people are busy. And, and that's sometimes convenience is more important than like feeling super cozy about you know, making a purchase. So right. um, I think it's gonna be, continue to be a balance. I think people are gonna get fulfillment from supporting people that they care about. And um, and then the things that we just need to get by are, are gonna continue to come from places like Amazon, Target, Walmart, Kohl's. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just, I, I, I think about it a lot that Amazon is just terrible for the environment because instead of you know, making a list of five things that you need to pick up at the store when you go out. Uh, you order those five things as you think of them. And, um, you know, it's like an impulse. And you just go, and so there's five different deliveries, you know, to, to your house. Yeah, that's the hardest part for me personally is, you know, I, I feel like when they first started out, they were better about consolidating the packages. And now it's one at a time. Um, and that's, yeah, it's really. Yeah, yeah. So. It is wasteful. I feel like um, they could they could definitely innovate there. That's something that they could work on. You know, a reusable. I don't know. Yeah, and the market might push them to do that. You know, yeah. uh, as you say, if more and more people are are demanding uh, their mm -hmm. goods to be sustainable, and you know, there's practices within the companies and processes that'll be looked at uh, a little with more askance. Um, It'll be interesting to see if they do change. But you're right; they were they were like three, four years ago. They were um, they were putting shipments together, and um, mm -hmm. you know what else? Different. We it, our family lived in the UK for briefly, and um, I remember when I would order my uh, my groceries there, they would come in these uh, plastic tubs. The, the delivery person would come with the groceries; they would be in plastic tubs, and they would just wait 
two minutes while I brought the tubs into the kitchen, dumped them out and brought them back out. There were, there were no shopping bags at all. Um, and we see the same thing with moving companies, right? Now you can hire uh, movers that, that have reusable um, like Rubbermaid bins, you know? Uh, they drop them off a week before, you pack them up and then you return them at the end. Um, I don't, I feel like there's, there's an opportunity there for sure. Yeah, that's interesting, that's a good idea. Um, so the, the pandemic has changed a lot and what, what effect has the pandemic um, had on sustainability? Has it been good for sustainability, bad in what way? Both, for sure. Um, the, the plastic waste issue has been exacerbated by the pandemic um, because of heightened hygiene, disposable masks, disposable everything. Um, but then the rapid shift in our routines has given humanity this, this moment to reflect on what matters to us. And that has been great for sustainability because um, people are just realizing that stuff doesn't, doesn't matter, right? It's the people all around us, it's our health, like really just a, a focus on wellness and, and um, what really matters in life. Um, measuring wealth and success by external things like big cars and fancy houses, you know, it's people, people's desires are shifting, right? So they, they want health in the face of a pandemic, they want comfort in a world that feels uneasy or unrestful, they want love in a world that feels hateful, um, they want trust in a world that feels like it's full of fake news. Um, they want uh, unity in a time of division, right? That the country is so divided right now and we're craving this uh, togetherness. And, and, and we want value in a time when life just feels so fleeting. Right. So if a brand can deliver on these evolve, evolving desires and values, they're going to be the ones that survive the bumps that lie ahead of us, for sure. And what, what brands do you see doing that or heading towards that? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think a lot of the outerwear brands, like you said, um, you know, Mara Hoffman is an amazing leader in sustainable fashion. She started her company just as a regular fashion brand and had her own personal evolution and awakening. And while her brand has been out of reach for a lot of people, she is also actively looking to reduce uh, the price points so that more people have access to it. Um, and and I just- Eileen Fisher. Eileen Fisher. Eileen Fisher has been doing a great job forever, and and just really the, the companies that are walking the talk, right? They talk about sustainability and they continue because it's not, you know, sustainability is a not a destination. It's it's a process, right. Right. Um, and it's and it's forever. You know, there's it's not something a goal that you can just reach, tick that box, and be done. It's and that's hard for a lot of people. It's hard for me. I like to feel like, okay, I'm going to do this thing, and then it's going to be done, and then I'm going to do this thing, and it's going to be done, and and it's something that can never be. It, it's right. a, it's a journey, and it's right. continuing always, right. and that's that's hard to grasp, I think. But but yeah. I think Eileen Fisher has definitely built it into their. Um, not just the product, but the, the business. I mean, the, um, the employees own part of the company and that's, that's just a beautiful, um, you know, holistic way of, of that kind of I, the sustainable ideologies could kind of build baked into the business model. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I think that sustainability is a, is a process and it's, um, you know, it's kind of like a, like happiness. You'll, you'll know it when you get there, but right? <laughs> when you start thinking about it, it'll, it'll go away again because uh, yeah. it's just too many variables. Uh, but it's, um, it's fascinating. And I, I go back to what you said at the beginning of our talk is that, uh, so, you know, some people think sustainability is, is just you know goods 
you know, about goods and about goods being, um, you know, used again and mm -hmm. the processes that they're being made from are, are, um, are friendly to the earth. Uh, but, you know, I think um, human rights and inclusivity and, and those things are, are part of it too. And uh, then it becomes really big and then it becomes a little, um, that becomes a little scary, you know? Yeah, overwhelming. It, it, yeah, that's the word, thank you. It can be really overwhelming. And I've definitely, you know, I, I moved into this space in 2012, I think, it was when I had my little, the, the, the start of my awakening, right? I was, you know, doing, I'd, I'd done the shift to organic food, you know, having kids, it makes you say, mm -hmm. oh, I don't want to taint them with the, these chemicals. And so right. um, I felt like I was already corrupted. So I, <laughs> I'm like, I'm starting fresh with you, Start again. Definitely, you know, and, and that, that was, that's a lot of people's kind of root into the sustainability thing is, is through food, you know, because we put it in our body. It does, it's not as, um, yeah, I don't think we think about it as directly when it's something we put on our body, but you know, our skin is our biggest organ and it's, on top of that, it's it's not it's a lot of times we have to start in a way that helps consumers understand how it impacts them individually uh, in a way that feels like it touches them directly because the the global issues, the bigger issues like soil health and um, air quality and, and water pollution can feel outside of us. It just feels um, it, it just feels like such too big of a problem for one person to impact. So I think for a lot of people to start the, the conversation and start the shift, it has to be about how it impacts them directly or their children. A lot of women yeah. make the shift when they procreate. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think that there is a piece of it that's also um, influenced by value. You know, when people mm -hmm. want to buy something that's not frivolous, it's not going to, you know, decombust on them, um, but it's going to last for a while. You buy a sweater and you know what, that's, that's going to be your sweater for the next 30 years. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's part of it too. I think people were just, you know, looking at how they spend their money and, yeah. um, and, I, and I hope so because... Oh, no, I was going to say uh, another cool thing that's come out of the pandemic is this movement toward, um, they're calling it cottage core. I don't know. It's just this idea of like living off the land and making your own stuff, a lot of DIY and stuff. And, and there's some really cool accounts that I follow on Instagram. Um, um, visible mending is a great hashtag that inspires me to, uh, to mend my clothes. And it does take time, but it's it's so rewarding and it's fun and there's a community of um, people that are doing it and it and it makes us feel connected in a world right now that can feel yeah. really isolated. Yeah, and that is somewhat of a lost art. Uh, so so few people know how to sew um, mm -hmm. that it's um, it's an issue. It's an issue even on a, on an industrial scale where there would be more uh, goods made in America. If there was the um, the finishing, the sewing piece of it to mm -hmm. to to do that, and yeah, uh, we're missing the so skilled labor. Big thing, yeah, yeah. It's a big thing, which makes me I wonder. I mean, you know, there's 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 so many um, people that you would think um, know how to sew. You know, that is part yeah. of their culture, but um, but it is a, a big effect. Well, I, and, and, you know, back to the holistic aspect, you know, as our schools have had to fight for funding, home ec has been, hasn't made the cut in a lot of school districts anymore. It's really? not considered, it's considered obsolete because there's not necessarily a future career in America um, that aligns with it. But um, it's, it's, you know, it's like uh, also, cooking you know especially people live in cities like you don't there's so much prepared food that you can get or you can do right. takeout that that cooking has been a lost art too and again during this pandemic you see all these people making homemade bread and and trying all these new things that they hadn't done before and i think it's good for us it's good for humanity to um to get back to these you know life skills there are a lot of yeah. life skills that we are deficient in 
Yeah. 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 We've, I mean, we've cooked like crazy around here, which is, mm -hmm. you know, making stuff that we've never made before. And, um, so I have uh, two questions that came across on Facebook. Okay. And um, what does the fashion sustainability world look like in 25 years from now? Are we going to get to the place we need to? Well, let me no just pressure. consult my crystal ball. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think that, like I said, I think we're going to continue to see the shifts accelerating. And I think that, um, I don't think, I think that we're going to see less polyester for sure. Um, because of the whole uh, microfiber pollution aspect, you know, we are contaminating mm -hmm. our own food and our own livelihood by washing our polyester, microfiber, um, nylon, any, anything that is petroleum based is getting into our soil, our water, our food, um, our air. And th there's just, as we phase out fossil fuels as a source of energy, we're also gonna phase them out in apparel. So I think that um, the future will see natural fibers and recycled fibers uh, become the majority. Yeah, go back to where we were 300 years ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. If they do something. Broke, don't fix it. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, the next and, and last question that I have here is, in the next five years, it seems additive manufacturing or 3D printing is going to be able to scale, allowing manufacturers to create products quicker and easier here in the U.S. Do you see this making a big impact in the area of sustainability? Um, I don't. Um, I, I'm very fascinated by 3D printing and I think it's great for a lot of products, um, especially like um, medical products and prosthesis and things like that. I think in apparel, you know, most of the materials we see in 3D printing are synthetic, um, hormone disrupting. I, I, that's not fair because there are a lot of bioproduct materials that are being used for things like this too. Um, uh, but I think that, you know, there's also a rise in uh, robotics. Um, for a long time, we haven't been able to replicate the uh, accuracy of human hands when it comes to sewing and assembling goods. Um, but there are some companies out there now that are successfully um, creating robotics for sewing and uh, for manufacturing. Yeah, I don't, I, I really don't think 3D printing, except maybe when it comes to trims, trimmings, and um, yeah, I, I don't see it playing a huge role. Uh, now, now 3, 3D modeling, I definitely is, is a huge, huge part of the future. Yeah. Um, yeah. In fashion. Okay. Um, why don't you take a minute or two and talk about uh, your class, your book, Oh, awesome. uh, things that uh, make Libby Libby. Awesome. Um, yeah, if you are interested in learning about more about how you can implement sustainable design practices or um, supply chain solutions to, in your role, uh, my course is covers. It's called. Um, it's the course number is SUS zero two seven. It's at FIT. It's running in. Uh, four weeks in April and May. It's just four classes, four three-hour classes at night. They're virtual. You can join from anywhere. Um, I also record them. So if you're in a different time zone, you can join. And it's called Current Events and Innovations in Sustainable Fashion. And it's quite affordable. Um, I know a lot, of, a lot of companies send a handful of their teams at once and cover the cost. So ask your employer. Uh, it's a great, it's a, it's a really fun class. We, people, it, it's cool because I, I usually teach in person. This was my first time teaching it remotely this year. And um, we had somebody join from Norway. We had somebody join from Chicago. Uh, <laughs> lots of, lots of different um, voices and, and people that from different backgrounds this too. And it's always really enlightening to connect with people across discipline, you know, is it really helps us to think outside the box and get outside our bubble, get outside our silo and make real change. It's really, I mean, the content is great in this course, but equally um, inspiring is, is bringing all these people together, you know? 
we don't, I think once you leave college, you don't get, get a chance to, to, to connect with people, with new people as much as you do um, when you're younger. So it's a great eye opener. I think I lost you. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking for the, uh, <laughs> I got lunch. <laughs> no, I, um, I'm looking for what you sent me earlier oh, great. Uh, to show the, um, the resources that you have. I appreciate that. Thanks. Yeah, that's a, I have a resource list that I share with my class and I decided to share with the guests here today. Um, it's a list of podcasts and books and websites and influencers um, if you want to keep up with this on your own. So it's a, it's a really um, comprehensive list. So yeah, as I design the course, I kind of pull things that I see that are really helpful reports, new reports and um, events. Can you see that? Yes, great. Okay. Mm -hmm. What newsletters, these are the newsletters and new sources I, I use to help inform my course and just to keep myself informed. Um, great research is coming out every day, everything in here is, is quite recent. So this, I update this uh, every six months. Podcast, the tools, under tools, there are ways to calculate your, um, your carbon footprint. Uh, you can check up on what brands are, are paying their, paying their uh, supply chain workers. You know, uh, the pandemic really threw our overseas partners for, you know, a loop they they weren't expecting their partners here to not pay them. So there's there's a, a whole comprehensive list of, of brands that haven't yet paid up for the orders oh, yeah. that they placed before the pandemic. There's a whole list yep. on there. Um, podcasts. The, I cannot recommend the root enough. That's that is really looking into race and sustainable fashion. Um, yeah, there's, there's, everything in here has been vetted. <laughs> <laughs> there's some books. Yeah. yeah, so if you're into this and uh, you want to have a dabble before taking my class, this is a great way to get yourself acquainted. And uh, again, the, the course number is SUS027. Um, yeah, and it's, and Registration's open for the spring. Please join me. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that those awards are, um, you know, people are giving away free money. So if there's anybody who's maybe, I also got a lot of people in my class that are um, changing directions, starting their own brands, entrepreneurs. And a lot of these um, grants and competitions give away, you know, money to startups, especially sustainable startups. Another campaigns. Yeah, there's 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 so much going on and uh, initiatives happening now. Yeah, that's great. This is a great resource. Yeah, it's all in one place. Yeah, I had to. The events were all in the past, so right. I had to delete those. <laughs> right. Yeah, trade shows too have gone virtual. And then these are some of my favorite sustainable fashion accounts to follow. Um, yeah, I, again, if, if you don't have the time and the bandwidth, it's great to just have some, you know, a couple of newsletters so that, you know, it's, it's on your radar all the time. It doesn't have to be the focus of your every day, but just to have things kind of informing your work uh, in the background, it's, it's so important. That's great stuff. Thanks.
Okay. Hey. Okay. So I think that about does it. Um, thank you very much, Libby. That was really great, really informative, really well thought out. Um, just uh, really thank great you stuff. Thank so much that, for having uh, me. I'm really uh, honored. My pleasure. My pleasure. And and hopefully the audience will um, will pick up on some of the things that you were talking about. Um, if anybody is interested in that uh, resource uh, PowerPoint or post-war PowerPoint, um, write me a note or write me a note through Facebook or write me a note directly uh, and we'll get it to you. I'll make sure that, um, that Libby is aware of it. And um, if, you if you want to get in touch with Libby also, uh, contact me and I will I'll make sure that she's okay with it and then um, give her email to you, okay? But thank you very much. And uh, thanks to everybody. If I don't talk to you, I'm not sure if I will or not. Have a great holiday season and uh, be safe out there. And um, that's about it. Thanks again.